This week, I've got another YouTuber and doctor, uh, Ali Abdal, who you might have seen out there. He's got a lot of great videos. And no, thanks for having me. I've been a, I've, I've been an avid listener to your podcast for a very long time now. So oh, amazing! Yeah, it, it feels nice to to kind of be be chatting to you in real life. This is this is my favorite thing about uh, all the stuff that you do, and a lot of the reason I want to bring you on here is that you have a similar approach to me of taking on a lot of different things mm. and seeing the value of posting stuff online. So like you, you are such the, the example of what I'm trying to pitch to people all the time. And I have a feeling you try to sell your friends on this too, that like, no matter what you do, it, it doesn't matter whether you're a, you know, an accountant or a doctor or a photographer, whatever it is, there's an infinite amount of value of just putting yourself out there with some kind of online content, whatever happens to fit for you. And obviously you've made that work. Can you tell me how you make that work? Or I don't know, your thoughts, <laughs> your thoughts on that whole thing. Yeah. So this is, uh, I think if there's one hill that I will die on, it is the hill of everyone should put, put stuff online. Like literally almost any time someone comes to visit me, like if there's even a hint of them being like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not overly satisfied with my career or uh, I wonder how I can get, get further ahead in my, in my life. My, like the conversation will always turn to look, man, just <laughs> start a blog, start a YouTube channel, start a podcast, like whatever. The solution uh, like, is probably that you're not spending enough time on the internet. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you always got to spend more time on it. Um, well, let's, let's spell that out a bit. I mean, I'm sure I've mentioned it before, but I, you know, I think you could probably sell it. What's your sales pitch when you're cornering somebody trying to convince them to do it? Why is it so valuable? So the sales pitch is that, it's really all about building an audience, right? And uh, part of the sales pitch, I, I, I suppose it kind of varies depending on what industry my friend is in. So I've got a friend who works uh, in Shell uh, in Scotland uh, and he wants to kind of go up the ranks in Shell uh, and he's trying to inter interview for new positions and things. So he's, he's, he's got a lot of interest in offshore oil rigs and things like that. So what I was pitching who him doesn't? is that, hey, look, exactly, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a big deal. Um, but he reads about this stuff and researches it just on the side for fun. So what I was saying to him is that, you know, if you start a blog where you where you start writing about the stuff that you're reading about anyway, then sure, at the start, no one's going to be reading your stuff. But over time, as a, you know, as you become more of an established authority in the space of offshore oil rigs, you know, at that point, you know, it's, it's very feasible that the person who is interviewing you for your next job will have come across your blog post somehow, especially if you're kind of sensible about sharing it on different platforms like Medium and LinkedIn or wherever these people hang out. I think LinkedIn is where oil execs kind of hang out. Um, that just being one possible good outcome of this. Secondly, I try and pitch the fact that it's just really fun to kind of write about the stuff that you care about, stick it online, and then connect with people who also care about that stuff. Like I think a big worry sometimes people have is, oh, well, I'm not aiming to be famous. It's like, no, no, it's not about being, becoming famous. It's about kind of connecting with your peers, your tribe, the people that, you know, are nerdy about the same stuff as you are. I've tried to really push that angle often. I had some, I was on somebody else's, live stream the other day and they're asking about that of like the benefits of yeah i don't know being famous or something and like that is it's just so it's so not what is valuable about it or even the idea of collaborating with other uh youtubers podcasters whatever it is it's like the value is that you can have a real connection with people that have the exact same interests as you like really quickly you instant i mean right now we're able to like pick up a conversation from zero yeah. <laughs> because we know that x y and z are all overlapping and i have i've just had so much value in that sort of instant friendship with like-minded people and uh, yeah i I can, no, no matter what it is you do. And I think a shell oil exec is like a perfect example. It's like, there is, it is so powerful. And I think we'll become so, somewhat of the standard. Like it's not, I don't think there'll ever be a time where everyone is, you know, creating YouTube mm. videos, but it'll, the advantage will be so great that I, I don't think there'll be the disproportionate power that there is now of being the one person that does it. Like it, at this moment, I mean, every year you are slightly less ahead of the curve by being yeah. the one of your friends that is, is YouTubing, right? Like, uh, and your, and your potential audience slightly starts to shrink, but it's not at all about having, you know, more than uh, even more than a hundred thousand, more than 10,000 followers. Like if you can just have a, a community of, I mean, the, the idea of like a, a, a thousand real fans has been around for a while now, mm. but it's still so real. It's just like having one group that when you reach out to them, they communicate back to you. 
it's I, don't know, I love it. Yeah, man, it's the it's the power of the internet. It's just absolutely yeah. next level. And I did I I'd, I'd not really appreciated this before I started doing the putting myself online thing because I'd been doing the whole. Uh, so in, in in about 2012, when I was in my second year of med school. I started this business and I'd been, you know, drinking the Tim Ferriss Kool-Aid for, for a long time. So I was sort of familiar with the whole startup -y kind of vibe, but I very much felt like I was kind of plugging away at my thing on my own and occasionally sort of uh, reading an article on, on Medium, for example. But as soon as I started kind of blogging and then when it was started, started the YouTube channel, suddenly it feels like you're not just, it's, it's not just you in your bedroom typing on your laptop in sublime text. It's now this sort of community that you that you're like friends with and it's just like really cool so <laughs> that's a big part of what I, I pitch to people in the whole yeah you know start something online share your work share your work on the internet great book by the way Austin Kleon have you have you read it no actually uh, I, I don't know that one oh that so that that book was the reason why I started a blog in 2016 oh, okay because yeah. because before that point I was all like oh man you know who who would be such a narcissistic twat as to have their own domain name and you know write on the internet like who cares what I what I have to say and then I read Show Your Work and it's, it's like this small. It's like, you know, it, it takes half an hour to get through, but it's just so well put together. And his whole thing is that, you, you know, if you can share your process and share your work online, you'll connect with like-minded people and that will just be good for the world and it'll be good for you. And in a way, he argues actually that if you're holding your stuff close to your chest and you're not teaching what you know, in a way you're doing a disservice to, to humankind. <laughs> so I was like, right. all right, all right, Austin, I'm sold. I'm going to start my blog. I think it's not that hard of an argument to make. What sold me on it, I mean, for, for book recommendations, anybody looking to get inspired, the ones that hit me back in the day, the first one was Tribes by Seth Godin. Oh. And then I think a little while after that, which that was before there was like the idea of an influencer. So that was a little less about, that was more like be part of a community in forums and be like a, a writing blogger. And then after that, uh, Crush It from uh, mm. Gary Vaynerchuk. That's by the time I had read that, I was just, I was hundred percent sold. I'm like, yes, this is of course, like this is now transparently obvious that we should all be making YouTube videos and we should all be. Um, but then of course I, I still fell into the thing that I'm sure a lot of people listening fall into where it's like, I tried it, it was working. And then I just stopped and I don't really know why I just like, oh, I'll just do other things. It's, it's really easy to just let other things in life pass by because there's always a, a lot of opportunities that we know could be good for us. We could be learning another language and we could be learning to play instruments and enriching our lives. And it's really easy to not do that. You know, I mean, maybe you're it watching is. TV, maybe you're, <laughs> you know, maybe you're exercising and it's more productive than just television viewing, but yeah, the temptation to, uh, th this is a good one. This is a good one to bump up the priority stack. Um, okay. Yeah. But the big thing, the big question though is like, I'm not, I'm not a doctor. So it's easy for me to say that like, Oh, just make time for it. Working towards that. You know, you, you were talking the whole time you're in school, you were talking about your studying routines and things like that. Most people can barely handle that process of working towards uh, being a doctor. So how did you manage that and still create content about it? Yeah. So I think the whole being a doctor thing is, is often significantly overhyped. Um, Maybe the experience in US medical schools is different, but at least in the UK, once you're in, like it's, it's really hard to get in, but once you're in, it's sort of like an easy ride. And it's not really the case that if you do really, really, really well in your exams, that you'll be any better off than someone who only passed by a scrape, uh, you know? And so I think in the context that I was in, it was about recognizing what game am I playing here? What am I ultimately optimizing for? And sure, in some of my years of med school, I was like, okay, I really want to go for rank one because this is the one year where I think I can win that prize. Fair enough. Um, in other years, I was thinking, okay, well, I, I know enough of the stuff to be to comfortably pass the exam. But, you know, at, at this point, we're on that uh, on those diminishing returns where it would take me an extra sort of, you know, an extra 100% more effort to get maybe an extra 2% on the exam. It's probably not worth it. I could probably spend that time editing videos instead. And so a big part of why, of how I was able to set up the YouTube channel when I was in med school was recognizing this and really 80 20 the things that I actually needed to know. So for example, in our final three years, we work in hospitals and we do placements and things. Um, but the way, the way most people tackle it is they would go in in the morning, they would follow the doctors around, they would try and kind of soak in stuff and they would leave at 5 p.m. Whereas what me and some of my friends would do is we would go in in the morning we would focus, we'd figure out for the day what specific thing we wanted to work on, whether it's, you know, finding a patient with a particular heart murmur, 
And once we'd done that thing and sort of actively gone through the mark scheme and through the examination routine, we would then go and chill in the doctor's common room and I would be editing videos and they would be kind of writing their own blogs or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> and so yeah. overall, I think it's 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 part of that, you know, 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. I think a lot of people go through university and especially med school, not really deliberately practicing, mm -hmm. but just sort of, you know, it's, oh, I guess I just have to go into the hospital. Right. Whereas you can challenge those assumptions and figure out what you're actually working towards. Well, and I'd also say that I really appreciate people like you and people in um, I'd just say like educated communities contributing to public discourse like this. So that's, it's one thing I really value about, uh, your, your channel. And, and, uh, I mean, I especially hear it in the podcast even more is this just uh, the ability to like create, you know, casual fun content from a perspective of, you know, intellectual vigor. And like, we are trying to all become a little bit smarter. It's good to read a lot. It's, it's not, uh, you know, pranks and yelling and breaking stuff isn't necessary. A lot of like YouTube culture can be challenged. And, and I, I real, there's always been this educational YouTube culture going on mm. that is, is huge. I mean, even I was about to say it like behind the scenes, but it's not, I know it's enormous, but, um, I just like to see this adult side of YouTube become like, have a good face to it and have a good representatives and, um, share the idea that what, YouTube is, is just a, it's just a public forum. It's just a platform that anybody can show up at. And the more grownups that show up there with something interesting to say and, and valid opinions about even everyday life, I, I just, I don't know. I appreciate that so much. So, and I think people that um, are really like thought, thoughtful will sometimes avoid it because it feels, I don't know, somebody insert the word for me. It feels vain to be. Yeah posting like this. So intellectuals will sort of step back from it and be like, you know, uh, I should, instead I, I should be writing for mm. maybe a magazine or yeah. maybe, maybe a, a blog. If we're lucky, they'll post it online, but so I don't, I don't know. Th th this was one of the things that almost stopped me from doing YouTube because uh, I mean, starting a blog online, that's, you know, there's, it's, it's hard to see the downside of that. But when it came to making making the decision to start the YouTube channel, uh, what I was really scared of is like, I, because I, I had this image in my head that YouTube is about having a sort of large, larger than life, effusive, charismatic type personality mm -hmm. and making all these jokes and, and doing all these things. And I knew that that wasn't me. And I, I knew I was just like a massive nerd who was into tech and productivity and how to study effectively for your exams. <laughs> and, I, and, and I thought that there wouldn't be a market for that on YouTube just because I, I thought it was all this sort of, you know, uh, David uh, challenge reaction. Yeah, David Dobrik type stuff. In a good way. In a good way, yeah, you know, <laughs> absolutely nothing wrong with that. I was binging his Instagram story earlier today. Um, but <laughs> but then there were, there were a couple of channels I came across. There's a guy called Simon Clark. I don't know if you've come across him. He's, no, a, he's, he's like a, a climate change scientist. Uh, he's like an educational type YouTuber. But at the time he was vlogging life as a PhD student at one of the UK universities. And, you know, this guy's a bit of a nerd. He was talking through his formulas for calculating atmospheric pressure and how he was writing them in Python. He was going to his local choir and singing there and kind of talking about these Italian songs they're singing. And I saw his videos. I was like, wow, this is uh, this guy is killing it on YouTube. He, he, he had over 100,000 subscribers and he's just a massive nerd. He's kind of like me. He's he's doing this stuff without resorting to, you know, w without needing to be hugely charismatic and things. And that's one of the things that I, I really love about your channel and your podcast as well. I, I remember you had a video a few weeks ago where you, I think it was editing photos in Lightroom or, or something like that. And it was it was so grown up. It was like you, you were sitting there with nice lighting with your laptop in front of you and explaining how to edit photos in Lightroom. I was like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm learning from this. And it's not like you've got this huge larger than life personality. It's just, you know, very pleasant to listen to and, and you explain good stuff. So I think that's a, a really good model the way you do it for a kind of educational content in a sort of pleasant, thoughtful way. I mean, I, that's the goal. So thank you. For, I'm glad. I'm <laughs> glad it's working for you. This episode is brought to you by Clean My Mac X. It's versatile software for your Mac that can replace dozens of other optimization tools, making your Mac cleaner, faster, and safer. 
In 12 years, it's transformed from a very simple Mac cleaning app to a powerful all-in-one solution loved by thousands of users. Clean My Mac has been recently added to the Mac App Store, which is a little bit more proof that this is safe and legitimate software for your MacBook. It gives you control over the files and apps on your Mac. You can scan through all of your storage and reveal tons of hidden junk that can safely be removed. You'd be surprised what's hanging out in the little corners there. And what's most important, it doesn't touch any of your essential system files, so it's not going to remove anything you didn't want it to. And plus, it can also scan for malware, including adware, spyware, trojans, and anything else that might be stealing some of the data off of your computer. It's also a great help when it comes to deleting apps and programs. So it allows you to uninstall several other apps at the same time, which can save you a surprising amount of space. Plus there's all those little system files that apps leave behind. It clears all of that away. And speaking of freeing up space, there's also a new feature called Space Lens, which can find some of the heaviest, biggest folders on your Mac and browse through your storage conveniently so you have the power yourself to remove old big files. So now you can find Clean My Mac X in the Apple App Store and you can use it on all of your devices that share that Apple ID. Or if you go to macpod.com slash Stallman, you can also use offer code Stallman2020 which will give you some great discounts. Whatever you want to do, it's great software, and let them know that you heard about them here on the Stalin Podcast. Thanks so much to Clean My Mac X for supporting the show. I mean, something that I always, I feel like I, I, I wish was a bigger component of, of what I do and that I, I notice you're able to integrate a little bit more is just thoughtful ideas about life as well. I mean, the fact that you're, you do book reviews, I think is fantastic. I... So I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I'm not really able to spend the time flipping pages. Like I just, I don't know. I, I, I read about two books a year and I listen to like 20 or 30 books a year. So I just couldn't ever actually read that many. And so I, I like being able to kind of push through that volume. Um, and I'd love to be able to talk about it. I think an advantage you have, like something that um, makes makes you really capable at, at covering this sort of intellect, like, I don't know, I'm calling it intellectual content. That's not educational content. I don't know, just more thoughtful content is the ability to be organized with your thoughts. I mean, you can even hear it coming out of me right now is that I have a, a real struggle to prepare for anything that I walk into. A lot of it, I just rely on my, the intuition of absorbing whatever it is that I, I, I read through, right? So I read a book and I absorb the big concepts of it. And then I hope I'm able to bounce that back to people later. I have a feeling you take a lot more notes and are actually prepared when you discuss it. Am I, am I right or am I? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I feel like I wish I, I took more notes when, when reading books. And I've been looking, you know, I tried reading that book, How to Take Smart Notes. I've been looking at kind of Tiago Forte's <laughs> see, Building a it, Second Brain Stuff. It, and the, the it, Zet, You, Zet you read those. I didn't even try to read those. So, <laughs> Yeah, true. Um, but I think... I don't know. I think if you were to, for example, like I would absolutely love to see a video of you with your sort of beautiful studio lighting setup, just being like, hey, guys, I just I just listened to this book on Audible, uh, you know, audible.com forward slash Stallman, uh, and then just kind of talk about the book just in a kind of natural way. I think you could do that really well. And I, I don't know. I feel like there's nothing particularly special about what I'm doing well, with books. No, I'm just so trying to kind of structure the, it in a... Here's a yeah. challenge I have whenever I'm talking about um Imp sort of important topics, topics outside mm. of tech, which <clears throat> I feel like I don't hit on the show that much. Uh, usually it might touch on, you know, living life as you're a creator, but I think there just are bigger topics to talk about, even like the, you know, larger ideas of like, productivity and being organized, um, you know, not necessarily venturing all the way to politics, but uh, ways that we choose to live are, they, they really matter. And I spend a lot more time thinking about it than I spend talking about it. And I think a big reason for that is that those ideas for me are really shaped by other people a lot of the time. So I'm not generating a lot of those good ideas. So when I talk about it with friends, I'm reflecting somebody else's good ideas and probably slightly misrepresenting them, <laughs> describing them worse than I heard them. And, you know, so being a voice for that on the Internet, like I, I could end up being the only voice for this great idea that I heard that somebody is um, exposed to, and I might do a really bad job of selling it and of, 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 of discussing it. I mean, it's always sort of secondhand, and I even a bad habit I have is that I need to qualify where I heard it, 
which I don't know if it's mm. a bad habit. I always feel like I need to give this person credit, but I realize the listener makes them start tuning out as I try to remember what the book title was. So yeah. So this is kind of the thought process that I I, I, I suffer from practically every day. Um, <laughs> so I feel like in almost every kind of extended conversation I have with someone over dinner, I will reference at least five books or five podcasts where I heard an idea from because I, I also feel like I, I really don't have any original ideas at all. I'm literally yeah. just parroting something that James Clear said, something Tim Ferriss, Gary Vaynerchuk, Derek said. Yeah, there's this whole long list of people that, that I, I cite from. And I also kind of worry about this thing of, does anyone care that I that, that I cite the source of these ideas? And uh, Derek Sivers has a good blog post about this uh, where he oh. says, don't cite your ideas, just say the thing because no one cares. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, even, even to me, this it feels disingenuous to present these ideas as if they're my own. And, and maybe that's just our own kind of insecurity talking where we feel like, oh, I'm not qualified to comment on this thing. And if I cite Austin Kleon or Derek Sivers, then it lends more... Uh, value to what we're saying but yeah this is something i struggle with all the time i feel like i have zero original ideas and i'm just repackaging stuff that other people have already written about and just doing it in a bad way if i think sense. on that detail of of attributing things it really depends on the delivery of it and if you're mm. able to pull it instantly like the more quickly you can recall who it is and just slide it into the sentence it can kind of always pass. I mean, whenever, if, if you ever hear Christopher Hitchens speaking about any issue, he's just dropping quotes nonstop and yeah. everything is <laughs> it's, attributed. It's <laughs> he can say where it came from. I'm like, if I could, if I could speak like that, that's, you know, I would, but uh, typically, you know, instead I'm struggling and fumbling over yeah. it. So it's like, oh, there was that podcast. I can't remember who was on it. Was it Patrick O'Shaughnessy? <laughs> yeah. Was it so other, uh, I think a good yeah. rule of thumb is if you end up in that boat, if you are yeah, tripping over your words trying to, to figure it out, then maybe just say the thing and, and, and leave the attribution because <laughs> nobody cares. But yeah. if you can remember, throw it out there. I don't know. Yeah, it's often quite, uh, it's quite like impressive in a way I find when, when I'm listening to someone or, or listening to a podcast interview and they and they are citing their sources i feel like it, it in a way it makes it more humble than as if they're presenting their ideas as themselves and i feel oh okay this guy isn't actually superhuman he's just read this right. book by this dude and he's citing from peter Thiel zero to one or, or whatever mm-hmm. i think somebody really interesting to have ended up in the middle of a lot of intellectual conversations is joe rogan because as he, okay, when he has a guest on, he'll bring on really intelligent, thoughtful guests that know the topics that they're discussing. And I know everybody has opinions about Joe Rogan, so set them aside for a second so I can try to make a point. <laughs> but he, um, I feel like when he asks them questions or bounces back whatever it is they said to, you know, he'll, he'll reflect their idea. I don't feel like he is great at grasping them. He's, I mean, he's at least not any, any better than me. Like he is not the one to do the deep thinking. He just knows that this is interesting and wants to get other people to talk about it. Um, but sometimes I feel like I don't want to come off as like, there's a lot of times that he bounces it back. I'm like, you sound like a bit of a dummy. Like it's clear how large the gap is between your understanding and what the person presenting is. Um, and I don't want to end up feeling that way, but at the same time, it's so much better to have those conversations. I mean, I think it's amazing that we have somebody that is into uh, ultimate fighting so that he can bring in a certain community, but then also um, bring on guests that are thoughtful, you know? So uh, I don't know. It's like, it, it's, it's, it's funny, like trying to sort of break down barriers of um, either being snobby about how you have deeper conversations uh, and and also just like trying to have it be very open and like, hey, like let's all not be embarrassed to spend a few minutes talking about philosophy or books that we read or yeah. life issues, you know, because I think we don't very often. I mean, I don't, I don't as often as I'd like. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. And I think sort of coming back to the YouTube stuff, when it, when it came to sort of uh, figuring out, do I really want to head in this route where I talk about general life advice, uh, which is sort of a somewhat derogatory term for just all of this, you know, <laughs> this whole world of sort of productivity, yeah. health, healthy living, mindful, all, all, all of that stuff just comes under this blanket of life advice. I felt a little bit uncomfortable with it initially because, you know, one, one school of thought is the uh, kind of what Gary Vaynerchuk would say some of the time, which is stay in your lane, stay doing the thing that you care about. So Gary Vaynerchuk would talk about social media, but he wouldn't be caught dead talking about, I don't know, climate change, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the other school of thought, which again, Gary Vee says sometimes is that, you know, 
if you have this personal brand, then you can kind of talk about the things that interest you. And there was a there was a really good video he did on Instagram like a year ago that really changed my mind on this, which was he was he was having this interview with someone and said the single best thing you can do for your career right now is to make a piece of content that you know is not going to work. And I was like, whoa, mind blown, <laughs> because I'd been toying with this idea of doing book reviews for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, oh, well, you know, I'm more of a kind of tech study kind of guy. Why does anyone care what I have to say about Atomic Habits by James Clear? But then after hearing that from Gary, I was like, you know what? Maybe this won't work, but it's a thing that I want to make. Um, and Peter McKinnon has has something similar where he ended up being typecast as this photo video tutorial guy. Mm -hmm. And then he would make videos about his everyday carry and his wallets. And he would get comments saying, be like, bro, what are you doing? I want an After Effects tutorial. Uh, but then he had a great video as well talking about how, again, when you're a personal brand, the, the benefit of it is that you can talk about what you want. And yeah, sure, you can serve your audience, but the more you can inject yourself into this stuff and talk about the things that you're passionate about, the more people will come along for the ride. And so that's kind of where I'm trying to go with my sort of stuff, just being more comfortable with kind of pushing the boat out a little bit and not just sticking to my lane. I don't know yeah. if you... <laughs> well, this is, a, this is a decent tangent for me to pin you down on something you probably don't want to talk about at all. But so as, a, as somebody that has studied the me medical word for a long time, right now we are in a crisis that mm. uh, medical experts' opinions are more valuable than ever. How have you navigated talking about and not talking about coronavirus, COVID-19, everything that's going on. I mean, you are, I mean, I realize it's probably not your field of study, which I don't know exactly what it is, but you at least would have a more sophisticated opinion than I would. So um, I don't know, how have you been dealing with it publicly? How have you been talking to your audience about it? Yeah, so I made, a, a I think, like three videos talking about it. Um, those I happen to have not seen them, so I'm sorry to oh, not great. to be redundant here, but it's, I'll watch them after this. It's, it's, all, it's all good. Uh, I don't think they're very good because uh, <laughs> stuff changes so quickly in this mm -hmm. in this field. And I, I think I made those videos about two months ago, just as sort of the whole world was starting to talk about it. Because I was like, okay, cool. I've kind of been ignoring this thing for well since December, uh, December, January, February. I knew it was sort of a thing, but it was only really in March that I started paying attention properly. And I feel like even though I'm a doctor, I am no more informed than you are, for example. Like I had to do a ton of research to actually be able to understand what was going on. And I still felt very imposter syndrome-y about putting coronavirus videos out there because I'm I'm not an expert. I'm not an epidemiologist or a respiratory physician or anything like that. I'm just, you know, two years fresh out of, out of med school where most of my day job involves doing paperwork and admin rather than actually treating patients. Um, so... Since since those few videos, I kind of decided that you know what my value add in this in in this crisis is probably not talking about coronavirus. My value add is probably just continuing to give people productivity tips during lockdown, and I feel much more comfortable doing that than trying to kind of sell myself Play as being expert. an expert. Right. Yeah, I'm like in general, I'm 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 not really a fan of playing the expert in anything. Like all I, the the vibe I give with all my stuff tries to be. You know, this this sort this sort of stuff kind of works for me. Maybe you can try it, and maybe it'll sort of work for you as well. Here's the catch twenty two with with all of that, and this is not just mm. how you're talking about it, but anyone else is that the the most useful voice a lot of the time is that is that like you know here our understanding is limited at the moment. Uh, you know, any of our personal information is somewhat flawed. It's hard to be extremely confident from an outsider perspective if you're not actually studying any of this directly. That's the that's kind of the correct approach. <laughs> yeah. And what that approach means is it, it comes off as, uh, you know, lack of confidence, um, lack of direction, um, and silence. A lot of, you know, you talk about it less because like, well, I'm not the one that should be talking about it. And so unfortunately, what ends up happening is we have a lot of very loud, confident voices that um, don't understand the issue. Uh, you know, and I, I'm not even saying which side that, <laughs> which yeah. side that's on exactly. I'm just saying that like, so much of the 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 strongest um or the loudest the voices that i that i've been seeing anyway are uh just only as informed as i am at best and we're all choosing different sources so i don't know i i, I was saying this in the last episode too so maybe this is just the the only useful message i can come to i've come to to, to be able to talk about is like I think a lot of people could use a little more humility when they're um, representing the side that they are currently coming down on and like how we should approach our day-to-day -day life, when things should open up. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of kind of conjecture and opinion flitting around there where it's possibly un insubstantiated, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I, I just want to keep kind of pushing that thing home that if you're the one on Twitter or Facebook 
uh, assaulting all your friends, um, you know, let's all like be, be thoughtful and, uh, try, like try to understand it ourselves personally, but, um, not misrepresent our own opinions as some sort of expertise that we gained over Wikipedia on, on a weekend. So. Yeah. <laughs> so that I don't seems, know. I mean, that seems very sensible. Yeah. So if that's the uh, conclusion that you reached as somebody that's actually, you know, studied the field to, to some extent or, uh, yeah. nearby field then uh, uh i don't know but um yeah i don't know what's also what's life been like like just uh since then are you i don't know how are you how are you handling it stress wise what life advice tips do you have <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's 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 been really interesting actually like for the first 2 3 weeks of lockdown the hospital was an absolute dream because basically we had no patients showing up and uh, you know, the public was, people were sending in free food and the hospital made a policy that they were now going to give us free coffee and free food at nighttime. And it was all so, like, it, there was such a community feeling vibe to the whole kind of experience. Um, now, sort of a few weeks into the lockdown, uh, it's starting to get back more to normal levels of workload where people are coming to the emergency department uh, as, you know, as they should, rather than kind of leaving things late because they're, they're worried about coming in, coming into hospital. But there, there still feels like a sort of uh, kind of teamworky vibe to it, more so than than we have normally. Um, I'm at the moment on on OBGYN, so obstetrics and gynecology. So we don't come into contact too much with COVID patients, but I've got lots of friends who are wearing the full PPE for like hours and hours each day because they are working on intensive care or working in a respiratory ward. And I think we've all, everyone's, everyone's just sort of adapting to it as as required. Uh, like we've switched to emergency rotors. So we always have more staff in the hospital than are actually needed just in case people have to go off. So I think overall, at least in my hospital, we've been dealing with it reasonably well, uh, but I can't really speak for the rest of the rest of the Yeah, country. no, of course. I, I think that's been part of it is that we, we as individuals have all faced a very different issue here. I mean, even as I, as I passed that question to you for a moment, I was forgetting like, oh, your experience would be in a hospital, which is so different from mine and everyone else. I mean, a lot of you, most YouTubers, for example, right? So, uh, I mean, it's it's going to be really interesting that as we come out of this in the in the long term, especially you know a few years from now, our diff- our experiences will be similar in a way because a lot of us were at home, but still very unique. Even though it's a shared experience that we all, um, everyone, everywhere went through this in, in some capacity, um, the way that we did and the way that we came out is going to be completely different. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's one of those things that like, I, I feel like every episode I have to talk about it a little bit cause it's happening and it's, it's, it's such a significant thing for all of us, but at the same time it's like, well, without reporting on any news on it, I don't know how much, yeah. new, <laughs> how much new value I have to add other than just to say, how do I feel about it this week? Yeah. Like, uh, so uh, when, when all this stuff was really kicking off, I was in two minds about, do I continue to make the YouTube videos that I would continue to make? Like around the time of lockdown, the new iPads came out, the new MacBook Air came out. And I was like, okay, I want to make reviews about these. But there's, there was just something about <laughs> kind of making a MacBook Air review when the whole world is going into lockdown. That just felt yeah. a little bit weird. Um, but then kind of watching other people on YouTube and, you know, I Justine and MKBHD with quarantine content and stuff. Uh, I think they both made a good point that people are staying home. People want to be entertained on YouTube and if you can provide the entertainment, then you're actually providing a pretty good service. Uh, it's not like everything now needs to be this doom and gloom that, oh, let's all dress in black and wear veils just because this is going <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think th- things that will shift is like, okay, so consumer behavior might gradually shift, like the products that people are most excited about, even when it comes to tech, that's going to have some, it'll move in a direction, uh, but not overnight. It's not going to have completely changed today other than everybody buying up all the webcams on Amazon. Um, yes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, or in my case, actually, all of the uh, HDMI inputs into my computer. I've never had a way to send it a video signal into my computer. So I ordered one of the new Atem Mini Pros. And Oh, nice. Uh, but <laughs> I've been I have, eyeing that up. It, you know, if you're going to order it, you might as well order it now because it might come next year. So uh, yeah, I'm just like, waiting infinitely on it. Um, but yeah, yeah so, I've been uh, I've I've been finding that with exercise equipment as well. Yes. Like I managed to get like one of these pull-up bars ages ago, uh, and now everything is out of stock. <laughs> yep, it's, it's exactly. Kind of yeah, we went through that exact same situation. Something that was nice. So recently, our the the trainer that we went to before this started doing stuff in a field. So we just like go to a school park now, and we basically have gym class. So it just tells us to run laps and uh, 
gives us stretchy bands and stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, at least I'm moving again. Cause on the, on the first day, cause yeah, I promised myself I was going to exercise through all of this. In the first few weeks I did, I sort of, okay. Like I kind of picked up some of my, my old routine and then, uh, yeah, that definitely slowly, it started to drop off. Um, so, uh, um, the first day that I went back and actually like worked with him, I was like, holy, I am so sore. So, yeah, that was basically my exact trajectory. Like I was, I, I, I the first few days of lockdown, I was super motivated. I went on Reddit, bodyweight fitness. I found this yep, Google yep. sheet. I adapted it into, into like a notion workspace. I was like, right, this is going to be me. And I did the workout twice. And that was about two months ago. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I realized I was becoming a slob. So this week I signed up to this online personal trainer who I met on Twitter, <laughs> oh, Twitter DMs. Yeah. Smart, uh, yeah. So now he's given me a workout plan and like a, a diet plan. And I did the first workout yesterday. And now like I literally can't move, uh, but <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so I have two, um, I have two ideas for videos that are pretty off course for me. And um, I want to see, see what you think of them. Uh, one of them is about Final Fantasy VII, and judging by your uh, handle, I wonder if you happen to have any interest in Final Fantasy VII yeah. remake. I, I I actually don't. I, I had no idea that my kind of username wow, that I've been using since like oh. age eight. I, so I, I think I think it's because it I stole it from my two. Yeah, so I I stole this name from my cousin who I really looked up to, or uncle or something. Uh, we used to play on the PlayStation One when I was like six, and his kind of custom characters were always called Sephiroth with an A. I was like, oh, that's a cool name. So when I started having internet names from like age 10 onwards, I was, I was always Sephiroth. And then it was only like eight years later, I realized, hang on, this is a misspelling There's of a, a Final reason. Fantasy character. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, I well thought it was then, all original. But. Th- th- I talked about that one uh, last episode quite a bit. I want to do a Final Fantasy VII episode. But another uh, video I've been considering doing is talking about um, sort of, okay, I, I don't even, even thinking of the title feels like I'm going to misrepresent uh, somebody but is advice for a like career advice for the generation we're about to move into because it's not necessarily like I, my career is taking photos, making videos. So I don't know how qualified I am, but I do have some awareness that there are certain skills that are suddenly going to become extremely valuable for a lot of people that may not have considered them so much before. And I think we already touched on some of them with having a public persona, you know, um, either, either blogging, vlogging, whatever it is you want to do. Um, and there's other things, uh, that uh, none of this is new to anybody, but, um, how easy it is to learn a lot of programming online, like just be just directing people to certain resources where like, you know what, you could build an app in a week if you focus on it. Um, I don't know, just starting that conversation. I think, so I think it's interesting that you say none of this is new to anybody because I right. think <laughs> I think probably you and I have have drunk the Kool Aid so much sure. that we think obviously you have to yeah, start yeah. a blog online. Obviously, just learn HTML and CSS, make a website in a day, and then learn PHP or Java, JavaScript or Python, and then you can make anything in the world you want. And ultimately, all of these web apps are just a series of database queries, and it's all <laughs> like mm-hmm. th- th- this is the stuff that you and I know about. But it is absolutely mind blowing to people who haven't come across the ideas yet. So I think if you were to make a video about this, sure, like a lot of your audience is quite techie, uh, but there would be some people who'd be like, oh, you know what? I never knew that I should start a blog. I never yeah. knew what HTML and CSS were. And I think, yeah, 100%, 100% worth starting that conversation. Like, yeah, and well, I would hope that idea. it would reach a bit of a more mainstream audience too, that there's just, you know, people that have never, that aren't techie and aren't aware of what I do at all. And they're, because this would almost be, I, I just feel like these are good things to get out in the world is there's, I feel like, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there right now that are like, you know, I just lost my job and I don't understand anything about tech. Like I'm, I'm not comfortable approaching technology. I know how to use my computer, but I never considered a tech job. Suddenly every job is going to have a tighter relationship with tech. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you will be building those apps, but that if, if you're uncomfortable with your computer, if you can't problem solve it, for example, I mean, even just when something's going wrong with it, if you're afraid to dig into the system settings or, um, you know, uh, copy paste command line prompts or, you know, a- any number of, any number of things. If you are afraid to do it, you're going to, that's where you're going to have a bigger issue moving forward. Um, if you are nervous every time you launch a video chat because you're like, oh, is this thing on? And you don't understand when your mic is echoing or what might give feedback or it is so powerful to just get comfortable with that stuff because that 
all, all I know about the future of jobs is that all those things will be become much more important. Mm. I don't know anything yeah, else about it. I, I, I don't know <laughs> where, where you're going to be able to go get your new job, but I do know that if you're, if you're not confident in this kind of stuff, you're going to have a harder time. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think it's, it's, it would be very worth, worth making that video. Um, uh, one thing I'm, I'm, I'm often saddened by is when there's people like, uh, that, that, that I meet at work who are sort of my age who seem to have taken on their parents' or grandparents' mantle of, oh, I'm just not good with technology. And I always like, oh, dude, like the fact that you're telling yourself that story, it's, it's going to be so bad for you later in life. Like, please, <laughs> come on. <laughs> and people are like, oh, you know, I still type using two fingers. Like, it, like everything you do on a computer becomes it's, it's significantly easier when you can type reasonably quickly. Like, well, these I think are skills phrasing it that way, on. that's such a good way to phrase it too, is like telling yourself that story. It, that's, it, is, it is one of those things because it's... Um, approaching it as if you are already going to make the mistakes. Like it, this is already something I'm not good at before I try doing it. Um, and so much of that isn't a skill. I mean, it's, it comes back to, you know, in the nineties when parents would ask the kids to set the time on the VCR, like that, that thing of like, Oh, there's only one person in the house that knows how to set the time on the VCR. Yeah. The truth That's is good. none <laughs> of us know how we're all yeah. just smashing buttons. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. Like uh, this, 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 you, you just make mistakes for a few minutes and then, eventually you figure it out. And I think it is whether you just have that little bit of extra, I mean, it's such a small barrier of confidence to be like, I'm just willing to make a mistake with this. I'm willing to, to like slightly break it or do it wrong in order to learn it. That yeah. is so <laughs> crazy valuable now more than ever. Like I say, like I say, there's just, there are so many people out there that have that attitude you're just describing where it's like, uh, you know, I, I'm not the kind of person that is good at this because I've, I've heard that all my life. I, I don't know yeah. why people take that on, but I, th this is kind of one of the reasons why I, I always kind of recommend to people that they learn how to code because yeah, you know, fine. It's, it's 2020. You, you don't really need to know how to code. There's all these hashtag no code tools. You can make a website with Squarespace and Wix, blah, blah, blah. Um, but even so I think learning how to code and building your own stuff is one of the quickest kind of feedback loops you can get in recognizing that everything is figure outable. Uh, and when you do that a few times, that, like, sit, uh, uh, like I, I taught myself to code in inverted commas when I was like 12 years old and I would do freelance web design and all this stuff on getacoder.com and try and undercut all the Indians, uh, which would always fail. Um, but like through sort of hacking around with these websites and, and stuff in my teenage years, it meant that now, like when I was able to start a, kind of a quote, proper business, I just knew that I would be able to figure it out along the way. And people would often ask me that, oh, how, you know, how, how did you go about doing this? Like, how did you learn how to do that? Did you have any formal qualification? I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> well, once you got the internet, every, everything is figure outable. You just, you just kind of work it out. But I think that's a kind of confidence muscle that needs to be developed by getting this positive feedback of trying stuff out. It's not, it's not working. And then you figure out how to make it work. Thank you, Stack Overflow and, and all that stuff. Well, yeah. Do you have any general advice in, in learning new skills like that? Like just taking on something you didn't know yesterday and uh, making it part of your repertoire? Yeah. Like, so th this is one of the things where that I, I really want to sort of push on my channel a lot more for this, this idea that it's just really fun to acquire loads and loads of different kind of skills, um, especially the ones that can synergize together. Like for example, being good at using a computer, being good at making stuff look pretty, like design, um, public speaking, uh, the, these are skills that no matter what field you're in, you can put some baseline effort into improving at them and then just everything gets better. Like even within medicine, I've had so many doors open for me because I could make a pretty looking website. Like I got onto this committee for some international plastic surgery charity back when I thought I wanted to be a plastic surgeon. It's, it's, it's really hard to kind of network with big name plastic surgeons but I knew how to make the website look pretty. So I offered my services and, you know, I was now kind of rubbing shoulders with these, these, these like big names. Um, so I think when it, when it comes to learning, learning new stuff, there's a, an analogy that I always go back to, and that's the, uh, the parable of the pottery class. I don't know if you're familiar with this. One. I am not, but I like the name. Oh yeah. So, uh, the story goes that, um, there's this dude running a pottery class and he split his class up into two groups. Uh, one group, uh, had to spend 30 days on a single pot, trying to make the best pot that they could. The other group had to make 30 pots over 30 days. So one pot every single day. And at the end, uh, the judges worked out what the best pot was. And without exception, every single best pot came from the group that made 30 rather than the group that focused on one. And so when it comes like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn music production these days, and it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking, okay, I need to learn all of this stuff and perfect my one, my one song. 
but actually I know what I need to do is I just need to make a <laughs> song a day, make a song every single day, yeah. shove it on my Instagram story or on IGTV or even my kind of even potentially my YouTube channel at some point. But IGTV is sort of less, less, effort, less right, of a right. bar. Um, and then I know I'll just get better. But <laughs> so that's what I need to keep on reminding myself of. No, I think that's absolutely the right attitude. I mean, I don't know if anybody, do you follow Jonathan Mann, who has been doing Song a Day for like eight or nine years? So he does the no, theme I for uh, ATP podcast. Um, I, I've always been toying with the idea of getting him to do a theme for this show. But like, so yeah, he's been doing a Song a Day for years. So there are, I don't know if you like pull up his YouTube, it'll say that the total number of songs there, but it's a big number. Um, and I'm just like, that takes... Yeah, when you look at it from my perspective of writing zero songs, you imagine the barrier of writing the first song to be almost infinite. I thought it's interesting that we we all kind of think that the bar that that there is some kind of bar for posting something on the internet that it has to be good enough. And like so when it when it comes to the music stuff, I kind of feel that okay, right, so my music stuff is absolutely terrible right now. Therefore, I'm not going to post it on my YouTube channel because that is, quote, serious. Uh, whereas I, I'd, I'd feel more comfortable posting it on Instagram where I know I can kind of uh, kind of just kind of uh, shit post and no one will care <laughs> because because it's fine. But actually, I, w- I wonder how much of that bar is that that that, that we think that, that quality bar is just a sort of self uh, arbitrary story we're telling ourselves. How do you structure yours? Because for like me, I ha- that is a big barrier to posting more. So everything I post to has different, yeah, like I have a different relationship with how comfortable I, I am putting something on it. And, you know, YouTube, I have the highest expectations because the- just because the audience is biggest, right? So like the most people see this and if it's not good, there's the most to lose from it being subpar. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, an Instagram story, I'll post kind of anything Twitter. I feel, I love the barrier on Twitter. Like I, I have very little, so I feel confident posting a few tweets a day, like, you know, song a day, that's hard tweet a day. Mm, maybe I can handle that. <laughs> that's quite um, good. yeah. So I don't know. How do you, how do you approach, or do you have that feeling? Does it ever stop you from creating anything at all? Oh God. Yeah, it does. Uh, but I'm, 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 I'm trying to, I'm trying to work on it. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, this is another area where, Again, like I think similar to you, because because the YouTube channel has the highest audience, that has the the biggest audience. I feel there's there's this huge psychological bar to putting something on YouTube because it feels like a big deal in in capital letters. Um, whereas I'm I'm going through this uh, program from video creators at the moment called Video Labs. Uh, it's like this eight week kind of live program where you figure out how to grow your YouTube channel. Yeah, that's great. I've heard them promote it. I listened to the podcast. If, if oh, anybody hasn't listened to like, Video Creators Podcast or the YouTube channel, like, yeah. there's a lot of really useful information in there. It's, it's fantastic. And so I, I signed up to this, I think about, about two months ago uh, when I was listening to the podcast and I'd been listening to the podcast for so long and hearing the plug at the end. And I was like, you know what? Fine. I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do it. I might as well. And we're in week six out of eight so far. And it's, it's been really, really, really good. Um, but one of the things that they talk about is the importance of storytelling. Um, mm. and how actually the videos that connect with people aren't necessarily the ones where you've put the most effort into production value. And, uh, you, you know, I'm sure you've seen this as well. Like you can spend years and years working on a video oh, and I it know. will get, it will get crickets compared to some sort of random vlog that you sort of did as a bit of, bit of a piss take. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to get better at, uh, sort of doing a little bit more off the cuff stuff. So the, the way I'm thinking about it on YouTube is I get all these questions from Instagram and email, as I'm sure you do as well. And I would love to be able to make a video just like literally just talking to the camera, answering that question. But mm-hmm. I feel, oh, if I'm making a video, it kind of has to be a proper video. Therefore, I have mm-hmm. to structure it in this way. I have to have all this B-roll. I have to have all these changing shots. But then I, I, I think back to, for example, some of Peter McKinnon's video. He's, he's got one called How to Vlog. And it's just like a seven minute, no cut, just completely him talking to the camera. And it's such a great video because he's literally just speaking from the heart. There's, there's basically no music, no B-roll, like nothing interesting in that video, just him talking about how to vlog. And I was thinking that if someone if someone asks me something like, you know, Kindle versus real books, I could I could, I could just kind of talk about that like I would in a podcast. Uh, whereas if to make it a YouTube video, I feel like, oh, well, I have to, I have, to have all these for and against. Maybe I can have like a two-sided argument. Uh, so I'm trying to, I, at the moment, what I'm thinking is I'll, I'm going to make a sort of mini series where... Every Friday, for example, I would just sit and talk to the camera about something uh, because 
the story I'm telling myself is turning it into a mini series makes it more legit. <laughs> Whereas right. yeah, yeah. just talking to the camera about something as a one-off it's got, makes it's it It's got a framework. <laughs> exactly. It's got a framework. <laughs> so that's the framework I'm trying to do just as a sort of baby step to be, to become more comfortable with having a lower bar for what I put on YouTube. My idea lately for doing this lower barrier. I, and here, basically the podcast is just a place where I can throw uh, YouTube ideas out that I never complete. So nobody hold me up to <laughs> actually finishing anything I talk about here because it may or may not happen. But um, so there is a YouTube channel. I have a second channel now for this podcast, which I'd been intending to do for a long time. And basically once lockdown happened, I was like, okay, I can, I can put the time in to do it. That's why we're also recording a video version of this right now. I mean, hopefully there's, no, there's nothing visual you're missing if you happen to not be watching it. Um, but you know, I just know that there are some people that take in the podcast that way. Uh, there's virtually nobody subscribed to that right now. I mean, it's tiny. I don't know if it's ever going to grow. It's going to be hard to grow another channel, but I could start putting little rambling, no B roll videos on there. And that's so much of it. That's like the key thing is no B roll. Like as mm, soon as yeah. I need other angles or shots to fit, fill it in, or even if it's not B-roll that I'm shooting, if I'm just showing examples of other people's work that demonstrate the concept, that time slips away like sand through your hand. You know, I mean, it's just, it's impossible to, to really, qu to quickly bang through a video that has a lot of beautiful B-roll. So uh, I don't know. I don't know. That's my idea of like just uh, talking to camera five minutes, I don't know. Could 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 be something I, because it also there's a challenge with the, doing the doing these long form things as a YouTube channel. That any time you see a video that says sixty minutes, you're way less likely to click on it. You know, once the time starts getting up there, um, and and so even I know that I should be breaking these into clips, like find <laughs> one part of the conversation that was the most useful. But then I'm like, okay, well that's that's just more time, and yeah, uh, yeah I don't know. So. Yeah, I, I don't like know all, all these ideas. <laughs> it's all these things that we should be doing. Like it's it's the same it's the same with my podcast. Like there are so many times where I think, oh, if only I could be bothered to find the thirty <laughs> second sound bite, and then you know just a few of those would make for a really good five minute YouTube video. But mm -hmm. uh, it's just uh, one thing I'm trying to do at the moment. So um, I've now got uh, two team members working with me on on the channel. Uh, we're, we're we're toying with the idea of using um, Otto AI. You know that transcription. There's this new transcription app that seems pretty good. Sure, I've looked at it specifically. I just know it exists as a technology. Yeah, so it seems it seems pretty legit. Like I was just kind of randomly talking to it, and it it's perfectly transcribes far wow. far better than anything I've seen. So it's really good. Um, so we were thinking of tra auto transcribing all of the podcast episodes, and then getting one of my team members to go through it and find like a thirty second soundbite and turn it into a video, maybe. So, but again, right. it just adds so much, so, so many barriers to entry, and I think. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I think part of the reason why you and I can churn out videos with the frequency that we do is we try and minimize the friction for it. Like you've got your whole studio set up and everything. Like I would love to have a studio where I can just turn the lights on and just sit in front of a camera. Um, but the, the more of these fancy things we try and do, the more friction it is, even though we know it would probably be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's always a struggle finding that balance, putting things out fast enough, still making them good enough. I never feel like I'm achieving it, but... Okay, so I've got uh, I've got two questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, the first question is: Have you got a B roll library? Oh, not at all. No, I I sh kind of shoot everything for each video, and if I'm okay. ever inserting anything else, I actually typically, even if I have the original footage, I usually end up downloading my own video oh. from YouTube because it's faster to find it. I just know where yeah. it is, so the quality is totally compromised. So I I, I don't do that very often. Okay. Because uh, sort of for the last few months, I've been experimenting with having having a B-roll library, and it's completely changed the game. I cannot recommend anything oh. more. Um, because, like for example, with the tech videos, when when the new iPads came out, I you know spent the time setting up my slider and you know trying to get it to work, and and filmed like so many sort of beautiful slider shots with the iPad. And then um, as as we were editing the video, we just kind of sort of split those up into sort of ten second long clips and titled them something like. Uh, Ali using the app Bear on iPad 12.9 inch. And we've got like 200 of these in a Google Drive now. And the great thing about B-roll like that is now like, uh, th there's so many different videos where you can in in insert a shot of you typing on an iPad keyboard, not just an iPad themed video. Sure, yeah. And equally for my day in the life videos, we've got loads of shots of me kind of writing in my notebook or making coffee. And now they're all in a Google Drive folder that me and my editor and, and, and the rest of the team can access. So, so, so when it comes to adding B-roll to videos, we, we have this 
kind of existing stock footage. And I've even tried posting it on some stock stock video websites just to see what happens. Yeah. Um, but this is something I really wish I'd started three years ago <laughs> rather than three months ago. <laughs> um, well, so yeah. selling stock is something we've done for a long time and I highly recommend. I mean, it's really? like, oh, yeah, okay. I, yeah. That's what, that's how my career got started was at iStock Photo. Which, uh, which, like, which, as a web designer. Which do you post it on? So for us, we are all through Stocksy, which is a co-op. And so I was a co-founder there. It's like a small, it's smaller company, but it's owned by all the artists. So the royalties paid out of 50%. And at the end of the year, there's a dividend for based on like the total profit of the company. So it's like, basically we all, all the, there was four of us that co-founded it together that were from iStock. And when iStock got sold, everybody that like really put the sweat into building up this community didn't get any of the, the money from the sale, you know, except for the, the owner. So he uh, brought the investment capital to start up this new company where it's like, okay, we all own a chunk of this and we can grow it together. So that was a really great experience. Uh, the only thing is it's, it's smaller and there's less people that are allowed into it. So uh, I I mean, you have great stuff, so it's like I'd go apply because you get paid a much better rate. The prices are like pretty good. Um, and anybody listening, I mean, check out Stocksy. It, it is a really great community. It's just you're not guaranteed to get in, unlike some of the other sites that'll basically, as long as you have nice shots, you'll definitely get there. Um, because I found it to really be a struggle over at any of the, any of the low, like the micro priced places are can be a real challenge to make a serious profit off of like when your royalty is 30 percent on 50 dollars yeah uh, and yeah i don't know it can be it can be tough but i do think doing stock in general is super worthwhile hmm. and now i don't know why i was on that tangent but, but okay, yes i should cool. build up a library of my own stuff too oh amazing i will i will check stocks out so because what we did for ours is we we submitted to like Shutterstock, but they rejected it because they said there was too much noise in the images. I was like, fine. And we submitted to Pond5, mm -hmm. which have accepted some of them. And I was going to submit some to Video Hive and Adobe Stock. And it, did, there just seemed to be so many kind yeah. of options out there. Um, and it seemed like there wasn't really a decent kind of aggregator service that. Part of the problem right now is that it's been, I yeah. I mean, basically you can try the aggregator service. What I've, seen the best results with is when people are, are able to stick to one that really works for them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that means that you also have to be like the higher standard you can hold your footage to, the more success you'll have. So if you can figure out that noise issue and ensure that you won't get rejected anywhere, um, that means that better places open up to you like film supply. I really like film supply as well. Uh, which is higher price, higher quality. Uh, and so it's same with stock. Like any of the places where as a buyer, by showing up, you know that everything's going to be good. That lets the price of the whole collection go up. And it also usually means all the contributors are being paid better. Whereas if you're competing in the sort of micro stock space or the, the lower price, um, more like bulk footage things like uh, Pond5, um, it's it's harder to to make good money there. There's a, the collection's more diluted. The prices are lower. Yeah, I'm looking at film supply at the moment. It looks absolutely amazing. It is. <laughs> it yeah, so, yeah. So much nicer than like Storyblocks. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, I it's hope a not it's a big difference. Thing, so. <laughs> no, no. I mean Storyblocks. So we still need to buy stock footage and stuff. And a lot a lot of the time we're faced with just the price dilemma. It's like, well, are we going to spend two hundred five hundred dollars on this one video just to get a few nice clips, or are we going to use our you know basically it can be like 10 15 dollars per clip on, on something like story hive so there's a lot of reason for the lower place price places to exist but as a contributor there's a lot better money in the higher end oh, things so. okay so i should try and up the production value of all these tech uh, tech b-rolls well I, I, probably it sounds like all you need to worry about is the if if noise was the issue specifically like that's a that's a thing you can resolve right like bring yeah. the levels of your lights up a brick bring your yeah. iso down a little ISO bit. down yeah yeah you can you can find a way I will look into that. Thank you. That's that's really helpful. Um, the the other question I had was, uh, you seem to be pretty good at using Twitter. Like, how do you how do you how do you think about <laughs> what like what to tweet and what what not to tweet? This is something that I'm I'm really struggling with at the moment. That would be such a uh, that'd be a really other good video too. I think a lot of Twitter is the place where the most of my friends in real life just aren't on it. Like, so many normal people have a hard time figuring out Twitter if mm. they're not already part of an online community. So you're at a huge advantage right now because you already are 
on the internet and like people will respond to you because they already know you. So if you, the, the most value in Twitter for me is being able to reach out to other public figures and have them respond. And you can do that as a non-public figure as well. You don't have to have a community to get a response. So I've just always really appreciated that. Like there's a non-zero chance that if you, you know, mention MKBHD, he might respond or mm. uh, Obama or, you know, literally anyone. Yeah. <laughs> you can get responses from them and it does happen. I mean, I, like, yeah, I've been able to have conversations with some absolute heroes that I never thought I could have any relationship with at all. And that would only happen on Twitter. It would not happen on YouTube doesn't really have a mechanism for it. Like their messaging yeah. stuff is too closed down. Instagram, maybe through DMs, but the fact that it's private, DMs are a lot easier to ignore. So even on even on my end, like I'm telling anybody listening, if you want to get a hold of me, like if you send me a DM, I might send you like a one word answer, like, you know, a thanks kind of thing. But when it's on Twitter, by responding, I'm also contributing to a public conversation. So there's there's more value in us having a back and forth about absolutely anything. So, uh, you know, part of the way to think about Twitter now is even as a replacement for forums, mm. which is a bit of, I mean, I think you're a little bit younger to me, so you might've missed like the heyday of like when forums were everything, but there's so much value. I mean, Stack Overflow is the best representation of the the power of them right now of being able to throw a question out there. And not only do you get the answer, but anybody following you also gets that answer. Um, and that's, that's how I think about Twitter. It's like, it's a public message board. It's a place to just have conversations. It's like, I mean, honestly, it's like the things I'm wondering in the shower, this is the place to, to, to post about it. Or those times that you happen to, I mean, it's rare that I feel like I have an insight that is so unique that it's going to really spread. Like I don't get viral tweets. That's not, I just happen to I'm not smart enough for that, but, um, the, the, that isn't the most important thing. Like, I don't think Twitter is a place that you need to be big. It's like, it's just a place to have a really, a, a very real connection with like-minded people. And, and that, that conversation can, uh, move very quickly. Whereas, um, other places like on YouTube, the conversation is very slow and it's very one-sided. You're speaking towards them. There can be some amount of discussion in the comments afterwards, but uh, the something about the infrastructure or the, the, the structure of conversation in Twitter is fluid. Um, it, yeah. Maybe maybe a, a close thing is it's all, it can be like Discord in some ways that it's like a little bit of a chat room, but with a more uh, open ended topic. Yeah. And like a little bit more of a bar than something like Discord. Right. For yes. Like yeah. 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 Something. You wouldn't just yeah, but, respond with yes. You would respond. Yes, no. You no. Know, you'd yeah. respond. Respond with something a bit, a bit thoughtful. Like, yeah. it, it seems like. So I've, I've had phases over the last few years where, for like, you know, two weeks at a time, I'd be like, all right, I'm going to take Twitter seriously, and and every time I've done that, like, like really good things have happened. So you know, <laughs> around about September 2019, I was like, I, off the back of my brother recommending Twitter because he's in like, sort of big into tech Twitter and stuff. Uh, he said, you know, I've got to get on Twitter because it'll change my life. And so I got I got on Twitter for a bit. And then I, I just randomly started kind of replying to people that I knew through YouTube. So uh, Thomas Frank and Sarah Dietschy, I just started replying to some of their tweets. And like almost immediately, uh, Thomas Frank followed me. I, I DM'd him about, you know, a question about sponsorships. And he hopped on a two hour long Skype call with me yeah. uh, and introduced me to the agency that I'm now part of that's completely changed my life. And I was like, damn, you know, I just replied to this dude for like a few a few times on Twitter and that led to this. Equally with Sarah Dietschy, you know, she was a big part of the reason why I started my YouTube channel and a really big inspiration kind of starting out uh, and still is. Uh, and again, you know, I re replied to some of her tweets. She, she she tweeted out randomly that, hey, I want to go on some more podcasts. If you have a podcast with more than, I don't know, 30 downloads, then hit me up. So mm -hmm. I hit her up and then she joined me and my brother on our podcast. And then I was on her podcast a few, few weeks ago. And it's just like all of these random connections. And then kind of the DM that you sent me, like, I, no, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I doubt we were connected if it hadn't been for Twitter. I wouldn't have messaged was, like, you Instagram anywhere else. DMs. Yeah, yeah, like that's the place that I've reached out to virtually everybody. And it's funny because there's a few YouTubers that aren't there. And that's always so weird to me. I'm like, I don't know how to get a hold of you. Like, how do we even, how do we even talk? <laughs> like email their business email address and try, you know, yeah, hope yeah. that it goes through all the Raid Shadow Legend spam or whatever. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. No, those are so many of the reasons that I'd recommend uh, of trying it. I mean, it sounds like you understand the value of it, so... 
just I don't know, just make it a make it a habit. It's a yeah. it's weird to encourage people to like get a habit of being on another yeah. social <laughs> network, <laughs> but I, I found value in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, w- w- one thing I've started doing now is anytime I listen to a podcast, I will turn it into like a little thread of like notes from the podcast. Um, so that's forcing me to actually think about the stuff that I'm listening to rather than just kind of you know listening a double speed in one ear at the other. Uh, and it seems to also be valuable for the people who follow me who might not necessarily be listening to the same sort of business tech type podcasts, uh, but where you can get a lot of interesting life lessons from anyway. Yeah. I, I mean, like we say, it's always easy to assume everybody has the same point of reference as you, but like one of my favorite podcasters say is every day, somebody's born that's never seen the Flintstones. Um, you know, we, yeah. we all need to be introduced to culture at some point and it, it can be very helpful to be the person that brings an idea to somebody at just the right moment, even if it seems obvious to you. So um, but yeah. I super appreciate you coming on here. I'm glad we could connect, Ali, and uh, glad you have a Twitter account. No, thanks, thanks for having me on. I will uh, keep working on the Twitter and, and try and improve the noise in my images to get them <laughs> featured on Film Supply. <laughs> I think you should. And if anybody wants to find Ali, the uh, all the links will be in the show notes. Mm-hmm.